All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to take Proverbs chapter 19, talking about fools and family life. We'll just jump right into the first verse. Better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one who is perverse in his lips and is a fool. So previous Proverbs have been critical of the poor, but here Solomon recognized that not all poverty is caused by moral failure or weakness. There are definitely poor people who walk in integrity. And so the book of Proverbs is honest about the disadvantages of poverty, yet it also recognizes that being poor is in no way the worst thing a person can be. It is far worse to be a fool who speaks twisted and perverse things. Verse 2. Also, it is not good for a soul to be without knowledge, and he sins who hastens with his feet. So when a person has no wisdom, it's never good. It may be common, but it's not good. And so Solomon listed it as a second thing that wasn't good. Uh, the one who rushes towards sin. On this side of eternity, we will also struggle with sin, but we don't have to run towards it. We should be those who battle against sin, not running towards it. Verse 3. The foolishness of a man twists his way and his heart frets against the Lord. So it's true that a fool is that way because they are twisted. Yet it's also true that a foolish man finds his more uh, finds his way more and more twisted. Foolishness is going to lead to more twistedness, and God intended us to be at peace with Him, but because of rebellion, which is inherited and chosen, we are in many ways against the Lord. So the foolish man or woman has no peace in God. Their heart frets against the Lord, and they are angry and perhaps bitter against God for their twisted way. Verse four. Wealth makes many friends, but the poor is separated from his friend. So when a person is wealthy, it draws many people to them in friendship, yet these friendships may not be sincere or meaningful. And so the wealthy man has advantages and draws many friends, but the poor man does not have these advantages. Their would-be friends find it easy to separate from them. All right, verse 4. A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who speaks lies will not escape. So the first idea in this proverb is probably that of a law court. And in the court, it's essential that the false witness be punished. Justice is going to depend on it. And this principle extends beyond the courts of law into our daily life. And God loves the truth and he wants us to speak the truth. And among men, sometimes the false witness and liars escape the discovery and penalty of their sin. With God, he who speaks lies will not escape. And Jesus said our every word would be held to account in Matthew chapter 12. All right, verse 6. Many entreat the favor of the nobility, and every man is a friend to one who gives gifts. So when someone is of high status and importance, many people want their favor. There are advantages in having the favor of influential people, obviously. And many people who offer friendship do so out of selfish motives, on the other hand. And they want the benefit of the favor of nobility and gifts that others may offer. Verse 7. All the brothers of the poor hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? He may pursue them with words, yet they abandon him. So to be poor is often to be rejected by men, even brothers and friends. And that's a contrast to Jesus Christ, who himself became poor in Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, to draw near to us in our poverty and need. So by nature, people are going to run from the poor person, and even when he tries to persuade and pursue them with words. In contrast, God pursues the poor and needy. Verse 8, He who gets wisdom loves his own soul, and he who keeps understanding will find good. So the possession and pursuit of wisdom is so good and helpful to us that we can and should get wisdom simply out of self-interest. In so doing, we love our own soul, our own life. So wisdom isn't just something to get, it's something to keep. We find good when we keep understanding. Verse 9, a false witness will not go unpunished, and he who speaks lies shall perish. So the words and sense of this proverb were previously presented in Proverbs chapter 19. The repetition is going to remind us that this is an important principle. In the law court and in daily life, God wants us to be people of the truth, and so he promised that a false witness isn't going to go unpunished. And so this is going to speak to the certainty of God's justice towards those who lie. Revelation 21 verse 8 says uh, it's going to give us a warning that liars are among those who will have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Verse 10, luxury is not fitting for a fool, much less for a servant to rule over princes. 
So the sense is that there are some wisdom rejecting fools who enjoy luxury, but it doesn't seem right. It isn't fitting for a fool to live in luxury. And Solomon spoke according to the wisdom of the natural man, which places great trust in nobility and family lineage. And this is one of the Proverbs that the Gospel and the New Covenant turn on its head, and where those who would be great should be as servants and not princes in Matthew 20 and chapter 23. Verse 11, The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook the transgression. So it's not necessarily weakness or lack of courage that makes a man slow to anger. It may be wisdom, here described as discretion. So a wise man or woman knows that they've been forgiven much, and this is going to shape how they deal with others. They don't act as if they must hold everyone accountable for every transgression, but know when to overlook transgression. All right, verse 12, The king's wrath is like the roaring of a lion, but his favor is like dew on the grass. So the roar of a lion is terrifying, obviously, even without the understanding that destruction is going to swiftly follow. And the same is true for the wrath of a king or any other influential person. It is much truer regarding the wrath of God or the wrath of the lion of the tribe of Judah in Revelation chapter 5. And so this is also going to mean that the king's favor is refreshing and life-giving. It also means that it's fleeting, as the dew of the, on the grass. The favor of God is certainly refreshing and life-giving, but it is not fleeting. It's as if God were an impossible to please, um, you know, as if God were an impossible to please tyrant. See the difference? The favor of God is not fleeting. Okay, verse 13. A foolish son is the ruin of his father, and the contentions of a wife are a continual dripping. So... It is grieving to any parent to have a foolish son, or any kid in that manner. This may run from uh, grief to ruin, as the grief destroys the father's health, or as the father ruins himself to rescue the foolish son. And so, this proverb of sympathy for a man's problems as a father now looks at a man's potential problem as a husband. A wife who often fights with her, you know, husband is like continual dripping in at least three ways. It is an always present annoyance. It wastes and destroys and it erodes good and valuable things. And it's going to point to some underlying basic problem. Verse 14. Houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. So there are good things a man may receive as an inheritance, including material things such as houses and riches. A man is blessed to have those things. But beyond the inheritance one may receive from fathers is the gift from God, which is a prudent wife. And this is a wife of wisdom, self-control, and appropriate living is a greater gift than houses and riches. A wife who is not prudent may waste whatever wealth a man has. She'll spend it like water. And every man with a prudent, wise wife should give thanks to the Lord. And vice versa. Verse 15. Laziness casts one into a deep sleep, and the idle person will suffer hunger. So there are many problems with laziness, and one of them is that it leads to more laziness, sending the lazy man into a deep sleep. There's no work to be done from a deep sleep. And so there's a great price to be paid from laziness. It's a total waste of time, and time is something we can't get more of. And one of the prices is the hunger that one suffers as one's needs are not met through hard work. The lazy man or woman puts themselves in a trap of sleep and hunger. Verse 16. He who keeps the commandment keeps his soul, but he who is careless of his ways will die. So obedience to the word and commandment of God is of real practical benefit. Obedience guards and keeps the life, the soul of the wise man or woman who lives according to God's word. So to abandon wisdom and live careless in our ways is to invite death. God gave his commandment to give to give us life and to keep us from death. Verse 17, He who has pity on the, lo on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. So when we give to the poor, we aren't wasting money. It's like lending money to the Lord himself. And God will never be in debt to any man. He will never be in a position where he owes anything as a matter of debt. Therefore, to lend to the Lord is to ensure blessing in return. God will certainly pay back what we give in compassion to the poor. And God promises that we will never be the loser for generous and compassionate giving. Verse 18, Chasten your son while there is hope, and do not set your heart on his destruction. 
So there isn't an endless window of opportunity to chasten and wisely uh, discipline our children. Age and circumstance limit the opportunity for effective training, so it must be done while there's hope. And there may come a time when you wish you had done much more to chasten your son or daughter. Right? Correct them. So to fail to correct your children is an opportune season, or in the opportune season, is to actually work for their destruction. Right? And many parents bring destruction to their children through neglect, not outright abuse. Verse 19, a man of great wealth will suffer punishment, for if you rescue him, you will have to do it again. So out of control, anger brings many problems and cost. Among the fruit of the Spirit is self-control in Galatians 5, and wisdom does not lead a person to be of great wealth or wrath. And so the person who can't control their anger is going to run into trouble again and again. I believe I said wealth, but I meant wrath. <clears throat> right? A man of great, of great wrath will suffer punishment. If you rescue him, you'll have to do it again. So to rescue them once isn't enough because the problem is more in them than in the circumstances that they're going to blame for their anger. And it's better for them to face the consequences of their action and hope they're going to learn, learn something from it. Verse 20, listen to counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. So one of the first marks of wisdom is the readiness to receive more wisdom. A teachable person, one who's going to listen to counsel and receive instruction, has already made much progress on the path of wisdom. So the bad effects of the foolish rejection of wisdom may not be seen for many years, yet in the latter days of a man or woman's life, it will be clear whether or not they learned wisdom's lessons and if they did listen to counsel. So if you want to be wise later in life, start now. Verse 21, there are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel that will stand. So it's the nature of man and women to plan and prepare for the future. Some of the plans may be wise, some may be foolish, but there are many plans in a man's heart. And man's going to make his plans, and he should, yet every plan should be made with an appreciation of God's overall wisdom, work, and will. We want to incorporate ourselves into God's plan, not our own. Verse 22, what is desired in a man is kindness and a poor man is better than a liar. So it's not that kindness is the highest or only virtue for the people of God. In many ways, it's the one most desired by others, especially in the modern world. And the proverb is going to show that kindness, though it's valuable, is not the only virtue. To be a man or woman of truth, to not be a liar, is of great value. Right? So we should pursue and value kindness, and we should not treat it as the only valued virtue among God's people. Verse 23, the fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited with evil. So since the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, it wonderfully leads to life. If we want life, we should begin with this honor, reverent awe, and submission to God. So when we have and walk in the fear of the Lord, it's going to lead to a life of satisfaction. The world, the flesh, and the devil want to convince us that a life founded on the fear of the Lord leads to misery, but the opposite is true. It's going to bring satisfaction and keep us from a future of evil. Verse 24. A lazy man buries his hand in the bowl and will, and will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. Right. So we're going to picture a lazy man sitting with his food, with his hand buried in his bowl of food. Uh, it's certainly exaggeration, and it basically is meant for anyone who starts a project but lacks the energy to complete it. And so the lazy man here has so little energy and initiative that he won't even bring his hand from the bowl to his mouth. And so it's an exaggerated picture that establishes a principle made elsewhere that the lazy man will go hungry. Verse 25, strike a scoffer and the simple will become wary. Rebuke one who has understanding and he will discern knowledge. So when a determined fool, an opponent of wisdom who is a scoffer, is punished, others are going to learn from it. And so the more innocent fool, the simple, may learn from this as well. And so the rebuke of the scoffer seems to do the scoffer no good, though it may benefit the simple. Yet when someone who values wisdom, one who has understanding, is corrected, he learns. He's going to grow in his ability to discern knowledge. Verse 26, He who mistreats his father and chases away his mother is a son who causes shame and brings reproach. So the Bible commands, honor your father and your mother in Exodus chapter 20. This proverb considers the person who does the opposite of Exodus 20. So when the father in his household lies in ruin, the mother is left in a tragic situation without the provision and protection of her husband. So by ruining his father, the imbecile leaves his good mother 
uh, as good as a defenseless widow. And so one cannot disobey God and the standards of human society without paying a price. One price to be paid from the mistreatment of parents is to bring shame and reproach upon oneself. Verse 27. Cease listening to instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. Solomon continued to give wisdom to his children, and here he warned of the danger of ceasing to listen to instruction and to wisdom. It's going to show us that attention and effort must be given to remain on the path of wisdom. If one does cease listening to instruction, then they're going to stray from the words of knowledge. One must set themselves on the path of wisdom, and with God's help, determine that they will stay upon it. And the meaning here is that it's better not to learn than to learn to refuse to obey. Verse 28, a disreputable witness scorns justice, and the mouth of the wicked devours iniquity. And so the witness who is not committed to truth doesn't care about justice or the workings thereof, and great harm comes upon society and its legal system when there is not a care and promotion of the truth, and the disreputable witness is not punished. And so the words of the wicked coming from the mouth love iniquity so much that they devour it as a hungry man devours food. And this is the kind of person who scorns justice and tears down society. Verse 29. Judgments are prepared for scoffers and beatings for the backs of fools. So those who reject wisdom with hostility will not escape penalty. Judgments will be prepared for them. And so those who regard wisdom bound in their folly will have their penalty. Correction will come to them in its appointed way, and sadly, the correction is going to do little for them. And so profane and wicked men expose themselves to the punishments denounced against such by just laws. Avoid, therefore, both their company and their end. That ties up chapter 19. Next time we'll take chapter 20. We're going to talk about wisdom, weights, and wickedness. Thank you for joining me.